morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Caring community. Aren't the kids going to learn different uses for a hot tub this morning? <laughs> so we'll all experience something different. We'll all experience lots this morning. So come with us. It's, of course, baptism day, and there's lots of people that are going to that are going to experience that from other, lots of places. We're going to experience it from observing uh, this public statement. Um, those that go into the water, may they come out changed. I have to say that my own experience was that way. It was something that changed. And so may it be a great thing. So stand with us today as we Worship the one that makes the holy water. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need you every day. 
is the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need you every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Here we go. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need you every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water on my skin. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound.
I think I might wait just to see when it stops. I think I might have to say something. Look at that. Good morning, Karen community. I was just watching you all interact, hugging each other, shaking hands, talking. I was going to see how long it would take you to sit down. Praise God. Thank you, worship team. Singing about the forgiveness that we have and the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. And we're going to hear some more about that today because we're in for a treat with baptism today. Testimonies coming. But today also feels like uh, homecoming week. Yeah, the, the good friends that we haven't seen for a while, like Mary Himmelberger. Mary, raise your hand. Mary, Mary and Ruth were part of what we deemed the Silver Foxes. A group of four ladies, two have gone home to be with the Lord, Phyllis Grimm and, and Vivian Kennedy. They used to sit together, I think back here next to the last row where Cheryl's at, the four of them, and we deemed them the Silver Foxes. And Mary, we're glad you came and joined us this morning. Praise God. Roger and Sue Thomas got their children with them. Last time we saw their children, they might have been in diapers maybe, I don't know, strollers. Glad to have you guys here. Stan and Tommy G. Stan hasn't been here for a couple years. He didn't have a, Stan didn't have a car. He got a car. First thing he did, call up Tommy G. Going to church with me? Praise God. Praise God. Tommy G over there. Glad to have you guys with us this morning. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, uh, just a few things from the bulletin. Uh, this week is the Ice Coffee House on Friday out the pavilion. There is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. So if you're going to attend, that's this Friday, so they need to know. So on your way out, please sign up. Any questions, see Rochelle or Sue for that. Please sign up for that. As far as youth, we got a youth, mini youth group meeting tonight at 6.30 here at the church. And then next Sunday after church, there's a pool party for the youth out at the Callahan's house. So you can be part of that. So that's happening. Other things going on, save the date for September 10th. It's our church picnic. It's going to be a potluck this year. Um, hands or feet are going out today. We want to pray for them. And also want to... Uh, School is starting. School is starting for some. It's already started. For others, it's starting next week and beyond. So uh, I want to take time not only to pray for hands and feet, but I want to pray for everybody that's going back to school. If you're a student, stand up. There you go. If you're a college student, stand up. You're going back to college or technical school, any school, stand up. If you're a teacher, stand up. If you're an administrator, a principal, vice principal, if you're a nurse, stand up. If you're a custodian, if you're a bus driver, stand up. <laughs> Cafeteria workers, anybody I missed, if you're, part of, if you're part of going back to school, teacher's aid, if you're part of going back to school, we need to pray for you. Parents. Parents. I mean, we got some parents in here, right? Stand up. Stand up. Because you know the battle that is being fought in schools. I hope it's being fought. We see it on the nightly news just about every night anymore. And it's devastating to our children what they have to face. Even going into kindergarten or first grade, some of the lies that's being indoctrinated into their hearts and minds. We need to fight that battle. We need to pray for these on a regular basis. So let's pray. Lord, you already know what we are facing, what the students, teachers, parents, and everybody involved, bus drivers, custodians, everybody involved in teaching our kids in our public schools and even some private schools as well. Lord, we need your help. We need the power of your spirit 
to anoint all these, especially those who know you, have put their trust and faith in you. I pray, Lord, that you give them a special anointing as they go back to school, as they take a stand for your truth, but also for your grace and forgiveness. Lord, help them share the truth in love and grace, but also help them stand for the truth because they will get much resistance. We know that. Conflict is awaiting them. That is, that is the truth. Lord, I thank you for them being willing to go into that fiery furnace, yet put their faith and trust in you how they may be used, not to go there and hide, not to go there and be overcome by the culture, but to go there and take a stand. Lord, it is imperative for the hearts and minds of our young people. Lord, we ask that your spirit be with them. Protect them. Guard their hearts and minds. And Lord, help them move in a mighty way to share the love of and truth of Jesus Christ. We ask that. Lord, I pray for hands and feet who every other Sunday go out and share the truth and love of Jesus Christ. So be with them again this Sunday. Give them travel mercies to and from. Be with them and cover them as they minister to many people that are lost, not just homeless, but lost spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Lord, they need the move of your spirit in them. Lord, I pray for them to experience your forgiveness. For the guilt that they carry on, let them experience your forgiveness, Lord, and that will change their lives completely. Do that through the mighty ministry of hands and feet. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for baptism and those coming forth to be baptized and to testify of your goodness in their lives. Lord, may you be glorified in all that we do today. And Lord, if there is one person here today that has not experienced your forgiveness, Lord, may today be the day. We ask this in Jesus' name, the church said. Worship team. stand with us as we um, experience those that are going to the river and as we um, think about our own journey maybe we've already been to the river maybe we need to go again <laughs> maybe some of us need to go for the first time Amen. I think that uh, maybe Pat will say this but um, there are certain people that are on the schedule today but this is available to all. So uh, you'll, you'll make pastors and uh, elders scurry, <laughs> but that would be just great. Okay. Come 
we understand that all of this is a process of purifying our heart.
waves of you. Waves of you. Waves of you just crashing over us. Consuming us. For your perfect will, consume us today, Lord. Not just those that go in the water, but consume us for your purposes. That your purposes would become fluid to us as we move with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. As things, as things increase in the world, increasing evil, increasing deterioration, why is, why is Jesus waiting? Because of, of what we worshipped. Draw me close to you. He's drawing people. He, he longs for us to be close to him. That's his heart. That's why he's patient. It's in the bulletin every single week. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. We think a lot of things should be happening faster and some things we wish were happening slower, but God is patient, and he's patient because he's left us here to continue to share the reality of who Jesus is because he is drawing people to him. That's what he wants. Draw me close. He wants us close to him. There is no better place to be than to be close to the Lord. He's working. <clears throat> You've been praying. We've been praying for months and months and months and months for Patty Attic as she's battled cancer. She's with us this morning. Patty's right here this morning. Yeah, right there. And I got to be honest, uh, Virgil walked in last night. We had a little bit of, of prayer time. Are we praying for the kids? Are they just leaving? Well, they don't have the older kids, but they have the younger kids. What? Come on. Come on. Get up here. Trying to sneak out on me? What, huh? What's up with that? Come on, give me some skin. Boom. Boom. Ow. All right, let's do what we do. Let's stretch out a hand, right? Let's stretch over. Oh, my gosh. Lord, thank you. There'll be no sneaking out on you. You know, everything we do, everywhere we go, every thought we have and every word we speak. And I pray for their young hearts and their young minds as they go to their time and they're going to careful watch because they want to come back in and watch baptism <laughs> watch your move and God you are moving in them and in their families we pray for their parents and grandparents for their teachers pray for their friends for the influence you want them to be in the culture even as we battle for the influence the culture is on us so as we send them to their time thank you for their teachers pray that anointing we pray it every week your presence your truth gets into their hearts and changes how they live, what they think, and how the influence will flow from their lives. We bless them and thank you for their very lives, their identity, destiny they have in you. In Jesus' name, the church said, now you can go. Now, I need to tell you something else. As we... Uh, we recognize Patty here this morning, and, and, you know, I've been praying for her. There's someone else we've been praying for for months, Sue McLean. And uh, she can't be with us just because of the continued battle that she has 
trying to recover from a surgery, and she needs a second surgery, and because she hasn't recovered, she can't have that one yet, and it has been a very challenging battle. But last week we talked about, and, and this is not, no notes or anything, we'll get to baptism, but this is really important. Last week we talked about how we are, when we are facing challenges, we tend to look inside ourselves, and when we do that, we, we, we can shrink down and almost implode emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. But Sue McLean, who is facing what she's facing, is sending cards of encouragement to Patty Attic. That's when you start to look outside yourself, and that's the healing presence of the Lord in our midst. That is what we want to be about. Okay? We all got issues. We, we say it all the time. We all got stuff. But if we'll look outside of ourselves to the world around us and their need for the healing power of Jesus, that's when things start to change in us. And that is a move of God in our midst, and uh, it is an awesome blessing. So praise the Lord for his continued move. This is a wonderful, wonderful time in the life of the church. Baptism. The body of Christ celebrating and declaring changed lives, because that's what baptism is about. Baptism is recognizing the move of God for salvation and the ongoing move then to refine us and transform us into the image of Christ. It is part of knowing God, making him known, and being transformed. Baptism is part of his, his move. Now, we believe that biblically, baptism was what's called an ordinance in the church, meaning that Jesus participated in it and he ordained it. He participated in baptism, and he told us to baptize. He participated in the Lord's Supper, and he told us to share in it. Okay, so th th those are his ordinance in the church. He participated in feet washing. He said, wash one another's feet. We do that sometimes literally, but, I mean, we are to do that by serving one another in the world. Those are ordinances in the church. In Matthew 3, verses 13 to 17, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. The account goes like this in Matthew 3, 13 to 17. Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Can you come to me? Do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so now. It is so now. It is so for us to do this. To fulfill all righteousness. We'll come back to that. Then John consented. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out from the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now back to that phrase in verse 15, where Jesus says it's right to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus did not need any righteousness fulfilled in his life. He was righteousness. There was no sin in his life. What he was doing was identifying with sinful man and getting baptized because he would be the one who would provide righteousness for us. That's how you and I are declared righteous, by what Jesus was going to do for us. They got baptized in order to represent to us that he would be the means of righteousness. So he participated in it, and then he ordained us to do it. He declared us. So later on in Matthew, what we know as the Great Commission... Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Jesus commands us to baptize and to be baptized. Jesus came to them and said to his disciples, to the church, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. And we know as we have unpacked that over the years here, that word go in the Greek is translated as you are going, make disciples. So sometimes you go to Haiti Sometimes you go to the other side of the earth, but it is as you are going today, as you are going to Harrisburg, as you are going to lunch, as you are going to work, as you are going to play, as you are going on vacation, where you are going every day, make disciples. It is a fabric of our lives in walking with Jesus. As you are going, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So, so baptism, baptism is not a sacrament. 
There are churches that believe it's a sacrament, and, and by that it means it's a means of salvation. But getting baptized, getting in that water will not save you. Jesus saves you. You get in the water because you are saved. I remember the old days. Now, I'm going to date myself. I don't mind doing that. I'm old. I admit it. But this now, I think it's illegal to do this now. But when a baby was born, what did the guys do? Come on, somebody my age. What? No, 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 no. When a baby was born, you're the father. What did you do? Hand, thank you, somebody old. You handed out cigars. Seriously, some of the younger are going, they handed out cigars? <laughs> Seriously, you would hand out cigars. Now, you would not hand out a cigar in order for a baby to be born. That would not make any sense. It's not possible. You handed out a cigar because a child was born. It was significant, an, an event. Now, we don't do that. We do flowers or we have coffee. I don't know what you do now. You celebrate. That's the point of this. It's an imperfect analogy. I admit it. But the point is that we're doing baptism because we are saved. It is a public declaration, it is an expression of the reality of what Jesus has and is doing in our lives. So it is not a sac. You don't get saved by taking communion. You, get, you, you take communion because you are saved. You're celebrating what God is doing in our lives. And, and in biblical culture, all of the commerce... The, the, the social interaction happened around water. The river was the source of life. We still build around water. You need water. And so you would get baptized. You'd go down to the river where everybody was doing everything. And you would stop and go, what is happening? And there was this public declaration that my life has changed. I am getting baptized. I believe in Jesus. I am following Jesus. And so everybody that was down there in society knew there was something very different happening in the life of that person being baptized. We got a text last night, some of us from Brian and Megan Knoll. They're, they're out camping this weekend. And he texted us. They were camping. They were going for a hike. Knowing that baptism is happening today here, they're going for a hike, and they come along the, in, just out hiking in the woods. There's this whole group of people at a stream, and they're, and they're singing praises to God, baptizing people. And so they have this opportunity to explain to their kids what baptism is while we're doing it here today. Does that smell like God or what? That's God's move. That's what's happening. That's what, that's what it is. It's symbolic. It's significant of life change. Life change provided by the death and resurrection of Jesus. There's a passage we're not going to turn to. We don't have time, but I'd encourage you to read it. It's in Acts chapter 8. It's verses 26 to 40. In Acts chapter 8, it is the account of Philip, who is a deacon, and he's led by the Holy Spirit to leave Jerusalem and go down this road, and, and, he, and he goes, I'm going to show you what to do. And he, he's led to an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, this is a, so this is a man who has been butchered and will never be able to have children, no legacy, and yet this man is sitting in his chariot reading from the book of Isaiah. And you go, why would an Ethiopian eunuch be reading the book of Isaiah? It actually goes 1,000 years back to King Solomon, who the, the queen of Sheba, Ethiopia, came to visit him and was so touched by the power and provision of God that that, end, that stream ended up following in the Ethiopian culture a thousand years later. And this eunuch is going, there's something that's in our legacy about who God is. And so he's reading in the book of Isaiah, and the Holy Spirit leads Philip to go to him. He says, do you understand what you're reading? The guy goes, how can I understand if I have no one to explain it to me? And so Philip explains this. From, he's reading from Isaiah 53, talking about the suffering servant the sacrificial servant. And he explains to him that this is the person of Jesus. And then they go along together and they come to some water and the, the eunuch says, is there any reason why I shouldn't be baptized? And Philip says, if you believe in your heart. And the eunuch says, I believe Jesus is the son of God, the savior. He says, that's the reason. And they baptize him. Now what's missing in that story is cultural. This guy was the, the treasurer 
for, the, for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. He was very wealthy. He, when, we, when you hear that story, you think, guy in his chariot, Philip comes up, it's the two of them have this interaction. No, no. He would never have traveled alone. He was wealthy. He would have had an entourage with him. So they're traveling along, and all of a sudden, they know this guy. They've lived with this guy. They've watched this guy. He stops, and he gets baptized. A public declaration to this entire entourage from Ethiopia. The eunuch is now a different man. That's what baptism is. That's what it is. We are now different people because of who Jesus is and what he has done in our lives. Turn with me to Romans 6. It's the only passage we'll read, and then we're going to get to it. Romans 6 talks about the reality of what happens. Verses 1 to 5. Mm. What a good day. Man. Now, Paul is speaking to the church at Rome, and he's just told them that, that grace is bigger than sin. So you sin, grace is big enough to cover it. So people started thinking, well, if grace is big enough to cover it, I can sin and do whatever I want. There'll be enough grace for it. And he goes, that's not the point. No, no, don't sin more so you get more grace. That, that you, you, that's, a, that's not a good connection. So he says that in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? He says it really clear. By no means. Or are you crazy? No, don't do that. That's not what it means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? That's a rhetorical question. We shouldn't. The answer is obvious. We shouldn't live in it. There should be a change in our lives. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his, rec in his resurrection. It is the declaration of a changed life. There should be evidence of change in our lives. So you get baptized. Jesus has saved. You get baptized and you live the same life and there's no change whatsoever. It has not meant anything to you. There should be evidence of change in our lives, transformation. In Luke 3.3, 3, it says that John the Baptist went into all the country around Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's a life change. There is a change in the way that we live. And you'll hear that in the testimony. That's the reality of exactly what is happening in Alan's life, in Jojo's life, in Michael's life. Three that have come to be baptized and maybe more this morning. We will see. So we want to celebrate that. We want to praise God for it. And here's how we'll do it. Um, Alan's going to start, come and give his testimony, and then we'll baptize, and then Jojo, and we'll baptize, and then Michael, and we will baptize. So Alan, I'm going to turn it over to you. You're going to come to this mic. You got to speak in it because we want to hear you. And at home, they're watching. So you can hold it. You can leave it. You can do whatever you want. It's yours, and then we'll get wet, brother. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, just listen to what Pastor Pat was saying. Change. That's, uh, that's really the effect that Jesus has in realizing that he's always there. He's, he's got our lives planned out from us from birth on. Where my fight began is I was born 1969. Uh, my mother, biological mother, was a heroin addict. Um, using while she was pregnant with me. I was adopted at birth, um, staying in a foster home for six months because of having to get, my, get myself off the drugs that I was born into this world on, and adopted into a family that in the 60s, father, mother, white picket fence, want a son, want a daughter, then they're happy. Well, I had a father that believed in that, that adopted me, but a mother that didn't know where that came from. And as I say, I was given up from a mother that didn't want me, adopted to a mother that didn't want me even more. Um, 
from the time I was in a crib, I can remember my mother coming in and it was always sneaky in the middle of the night, just hitting me in the head in diapers, telling me I'm not her son, I'll never be her son, don't ever think I'm her son. Um, remember standing up in the crib until I could see the, the daylight come out from underneath the shades, knowing my dad was getting ready to wake me up, get his day started. Um, my father worked for U.S. Customs at this time, so back then in the 60s, you had to live in the District of Columbia. So we, I grew up in Southeast D.C. Um, very, very tough times in the city. Um, I was introduced to violence, the drug game, at, at an early age, nine years old. Um, through all this time, the torture from my mother, um, her mother got even worse. Um, my grandmother used to pluck my testicles in the bathtub until I'd cry bloody murder for numerous, numerous minutes to where I couldn't breathe, I couldn't get my air. Um, and did this until I was about seven years old when my father really started believing these things were going on. My father was living this life too. Of course, the man that wanted this son that this woman despised would stand beside me and be there for everything I needed and never realized he was going through the same thing. I never saw any affection in my, in my family. Never saw my parents sleep in the same room um, and just always wondered why my dad was such a beaten man. Um, seven years old, I started boxing. My father wanted me to box one just from being bullied in the city. Um, being the only white kid around, I was being bullied. Um, got into boxing at seven years old, which was probably the first time I realized God was reaching out for me, like to show me something's better, to give me a direction where I could release some of this anger and hurt by hitting the heavy bags, by taking direction. Um, it was fine. I was adopted into a Jewish family. <laughs> so being raised like that, the only thing my mother cared about was the faith and that her son would make amends by having this bar mitzvah and having a celebration in the Jewish culture, which, um, again, didn't do so well. Uh, the upbringing schools didn't make it out of the eighth grade. Um, tried to tell adults, tried to tell people what was going on in my life, but I was a problem child by then. Nobody believed me. They thought I was telling stories. You didn't hear of these things back then. Um, now it's an everyday occurrence in families. So really, my testimony of, of the part where God was reaching out, 13 years old, I held my mother to knife point for 16 hours. Half of Howard County and Baltimore County police were around wanted to hurt her, but God was sitting there saying, don't hurt her. I wanted to put this fear of all the years she put into me, and I thought I could do this in all a 16 hour period. So I went from being bar mitzvah at 13 years old to being in juvenile jail from the time I was 13 years old till I was 15 years old. Had a chance to go home every 30 days but every time we went in front of the judge, my father sitting there depressed, beaten man, with his head down, knowing my mother would say, I'm not ready for him to come home. Send him back. And finally, I maxed out um, where they couldn't hold me any more than two years. So I went home at 15 years old. Um, started really getting tied down into the boxing and really tied down into life. Um, 17 years old, I signed with Top Rank Boxing. Um, got a bonus for $75,000 at 17 years old and went from training every day to starting to chase girls, going to the bar, being around the wrong crowds. I thought I was a celebrity before I ever put any work into it. Went I went to as a professional and Bob Arum froze my contract right there, said you'll never box again for six years. So I ended up being a sparring partner for Mike Tyson 
at a very early age. Um, was up with Kevin Rooney up in Catskill, New York, and at 19 years old, I met my wife. Um, small town girl <laughs> from Scranton, PA. Met her here in Harrisburg, fell in love with her. Um, went back to training camps and then had my trainer call her one night at 2 a.m. to let her know why I was standing there hearing his voice that myself and some of the other fighters haven't been faithful to our wives, me included. To make sure my wife knew this at 2 a.m. in a drunken rage, that I wasn't welcome back there. Well, here I had a one-year-old son, my wife being pregnant with our daughter, strong woman, she threw my butt to the curve, and she needed to do that. I was getting ready and starting my phase of putting my children through that same curse that I went through. Um, not that I didn't want to be a father, I was scared to be a father. I was scared I was going to hurt my kids. Nothing like what I went through, but just the fear of the anger I had, not knowing how to be a father. So we were separated for 11 years. We both remarried. We both had horrible second marriages. Um, but I was blessed with one thing out of that second marriage, was a daughter that wasn't biologically mine that I raised from since she was nine years old. To come to find out when I got back on my kids' lives, they went through the exact same things I went through with their stepfather as I went through with my biological mother, or my adoptive mother, I'm sorry. Um, I got to call my wife 19 years ago, or sorry, 15 years ago, right before Thanksgiving, and my daughter wrote a letter to my father asking where her father was. And my father called me 20 minutes later saying, oh my gosh, you need to call your kids, they're looking for you. He said, give them a little bit though, they need to, you know, they just talked to me, they need to unwind. A couple minutes went by, I called my, I, I, I call, I hear this little voice going, hello? And it was such a young, high-pitched voice, I said, Chris? I was so nervous. As my son rings back, no, it's your son, Jeremy. Oh, well, son, I said, I need to talk to your mom before I can even say anything to you guys. I had no clue where my wife was coming from, if she was okay with this. Um, so my wife gets on the phone and said, nope, the kids have been wanting to meet with you. I find out through questioning that she's divorced. So this was a good time to visit, I said. <laughs> It was around Thanksgiving. I said to my wife, you know, I'd love to come see my kids. She was like, how about we wait a little bit, let the kids absorb this a little bit. Well, as I said, that was 15 years ago, two weeks prior to Thanksgiving. I came in for Thanksgiving, and the Lord blessed me here 15 years later, married to my wife and back with my kids. Um, breaking that generational curse. I had that chance to take all the hurt, and from what I've learned with what I went through with my family and my upbringing, I knew that was God working in me to be able to help turn my kids' lives around. And with everything they went through, not getting into details, but everything they went through, I have my youngest daughter is a nurse. Um, my oldest daughter is a recruiter for the National Guard. State police are trying to recruit her. They want her. She's doing very well. My, my oldest son makes a perfect housewife. He, his wife is, works for the VA helping veterans. She's there all the time. He kind of takes care of the household. Um, but my two daughters are now walking in Christ. Not from anything I said. Not from anything I told them, because Lord knows when I first came back in their lives, it was everything against God. Um, what happened to them? What happened to me? But then to realize, no, this was the Lord the whole time. From somebody that doubted him my whole life, that despised him my whole life, 
to find out that this was the only person that was patient with me and learned and taught me how to find myself through Jesus and have a relationship with God, which automatically led by example. No more having to tell my kids. My kids just saw this in their father, saw this behavior change, saw this change is what pastor said about. And it was all for the Lord. And I work now at Five Stones Ministry and Fight Club, which I work with youth from 18 to 35 year old men that are going through the same stuff I was going through. So I'm bringing kids to Christ through training. And um, I, part of my testimony is I dare anybody to tell me it's not God. And not because I fought with Mike Tyson, because you can't explain anything different than that. And the Lord has been amazing, still working in my life every day. And it, it's a blessing because if it wasn't the Lord, I'd be dead or in prison, the only two. And now I'm a father with my family, a husband with, to my wife, and I've learned how to lead through Jesus Christ in my heart. So I gotta tell you this, um, because of the boxing, um, uh, you would not know if you heard Alan, you just did that he has CTP. And so one of the one of the byproducts of that is he, he is susceptible to cold temperatures. He gets cold very fast. And so he texted me this morning and he said, uh, I hope the water's 80. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so when we when we filled this on Thursday it was 58 <laughs> but living water sent along a heater so uh, we're standing in 93 degree water uh, I'm loving it too <laughs> so this, this is a beautiful thing just a provision of God so Alan I just want you to turn this way and move up this way a little bit because we, we need room to get all of you under and listen wait based on based on your testimony of Jesus Christ being your Savior. It is for Sheldon and me just an absolute privilege and an eternal, an eternal pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go. Hi, I'm going to take this off. Um, my testimony is a lot different from his. Um, I grew up in a Christian home. Harrisburg First was my home. Um, I was actually baptized there when I was about 13. I became a follower of Jesus Christ when I was 14. Um, most of you know my uncle, Big Andy. Um, he was my uncle for since I was like 11. Um, his testimony changed my life, and but I grew up, like I said, I grew up in a Christian home, uh, had many, many family there. Uh, I lost a lot of family members in the last 30 years. Uh, my grandma died last year, a month after my uncle did, and those two were my biggest supporters in my life. Moral support, moral support. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay, it's okay. 
Yeah, we got this. You, you can do it. Okay. <sighs> this past March, I came and I wasn't going to come to church, but I did. And I'm glad I did because I asked God back into my life. Because I lost him so long ago. I gambled in witchcraft, which is not the best thing for a Christian to do. Um, it only lasted a few years, but I was addicted to cigarettes. This past May, I, I quit smoking. The reason why is because I have a hole in my heart. Last July, I was sent to the hospital with, I was throwing up, I had a migraine, and I was dizzy. I had two minor strokes. Uh, found out I was diabetic, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Um, so I've changed completely, and God has changed me, where I'm actually talking to my heart doctor, and they're talking about closing my heart. So I'm hoping that helps. But I decided to get baptized again because the first time I was 13, I didn't know what I was doing. And then I got saved. And God is telling me he wants to be in my life and change my life. And I'm, I'm glad he did because my cha life has been changed completely because of these two women beside me. <laughs> um, and Jesus. And Jesus, <laughs> yes. <laughs> They've been helping me. <laughs> so thank you. the Lord. Um, the Lord never lost her. I also want to tell you that um, George has been part of Jerry and Sudi's grief share. Yes. And uh, that has been a huge, huge blessing. Jojo, because of the declaration of uh, your faith in Christ and the fact that um, you're coming back to him and we see the evidence of that in your life. And uh, that is the public declaration of the day. He's been drawing you for a long time, and you are back, and we're excited where that's going to go. So Sheldon and I, in this church, we, we celebrate with you, and we baptize you in the name of Jesus, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, Michael, why have you come to be baptized? Because um, God is my Lord and Savior. All right. He, uh, he's accepted Jesus as a Savior. And I want to tell you, at this age, he's also, he asked his father and he asked his uncle, said, do you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, we may, have, we may have a young evangelist at play here in the way that he lives his life. And so, this is a great privilege. Michael, come on down here. <laughs> Michael, because of your declaration that Jesus is your Savior, it is our privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here we go. <laughs> Women would kill for his hair. <laughs> <laughs> Brad would kill for it. <laughs> <laughs> I would kill for any hair. You and everybody's just trying. <laughs> Look, we don't want to. We don't want to end today. You know, as you have witnessed this, is God speaking to you? Do, 
right now do you need to get baptized? We got towels. We're not gonna we're not gonna wait long, but if you'd like to, you want to give me that opportunity. Um, do you think now is the time? Yeah, I got to do this. Please come on. God is moving. You want to continue walking in that? Be sensitive to His His voice because He's drawing people. And uh, the testimony you have seen today is pretty clear. There's nothing that you're experiencing that His grace can't cover. There's nothing that can't cover. And that's what this is all about: the move of God to redeem. And give us the life he's always wanted us to live. Amen? Let me pray, and then I'm going to get out of this. And the venue and the worship team will come and close us out with Shelby. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your move in Alan's life. Your move in JoJo's life. Your move in Michael's life. Your move in our lives. We're not done. We're not done until you come. And there are so many that need to hear. So many that need to know. So as we continue to celebrate what you're doing in our midst, expand the circle. Expand those that we have contact with. Make us aware. Fill us with your spirit. That we might declare you to the world around us. Today with baptism, but the rest of the time with just the daily way we live our lives. And that we speak the name of Jesus from our midst. In his name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 Is that fun, guys, or what? Huh? I want to go in. If you want to go in, <laughs> talk to mama. Talk to mama. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay? Talk to mom and dad. Okay? Okay, our last praise song is called Glorious Day. And you wonder sometimes why you pick certain music. I was buried beneath my shame. Who can carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. Praise God. Think about what just happened. Think about the salvation that happened, and then think about the public uh, identification with God, with Jesus. That all of that, Jesus now has. So stand with us as we sing this last song. Now 
your freedom is all that I know. The old maid knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You call my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day I needed I needed rescue, my sin was heavy A chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, but when you call my name, I ran out of that grave. Out of, out of the darkness, into your glorious I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, the chains broke at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer, now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, but when you call my name, we ran out of that grave. Jesus called the name of Alan, Jojo, and Michael. And we got to watch them run out of the grave. Keep doing what you're doing. Go and make disciples because we want to see more people run out of the grave. Thank God for his mercies and the freedom that he gives us. Praise God. Hands and feet need your help. The end of the building. Praise God. Hey, what's the, uh, what's the bathrooms? The floor's a little slippery in there because that's where they changed. Watch yourself.